Bibles, I want to call your attention this morning to Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2. <clears throat> Four major prophets, 12 minor prophets. <clears throat> Amen. Where I took my study course, they said there was four major prophets, but they never even touched on Daniel, not one question on the book of Daniel. I like Daniel myself. <clears throat> Bless your heart, sister. Amen. Everyone that forgives her, say amen. amen. Surely. Amen. That's all taken care of. The devil never bother you about that again. Praise the Lord. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 2. <clears throat> I don't know why I asked that question yesterday. That just, that was out before I even thought about it. I don't very often put tests on folks, but that was out. It was all right. and hurt any of us. Amen. Beginning with verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem. Did you ever notice the three middle letters of Jerusalem? I'm not like Brother Fay. I didn't have a good spelling teacher. Brother, I mean, I use the dictionary. So I type J-E-R, and then I look again. U-S-A. I don't know if that has any significance or any meaning at all, but I noted that. Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, <clears throat> the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown, Israel was holiness unto the Lord, and the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob. <coughs> Pardon me. And all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, <coughs> what iniquities... Or what iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me and have walked after vanity and are become vain? Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt? And I brought you into a plentiful country, to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. The priest said not, Where is the Lord? And they that handled the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Wherefore I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. For pass over the isles of Chittim and see, and send to Kedar, and consider diligently, and see if there be such a thing. Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. I want to talk to you this morning <clears throat> about heart backsliding. Heart backsliding. Some folk don't believe it's possible to backslide. I was reading some while back. Let's turn over for a moment to the 18th chapter of Matthew. Matthew chapter 18. I was reading <clears throat> some while back writings by Wesley. And uh, in this 18th chapter of Matthew, verses 23 through 35, I'll not read all of that, but... <clears throat> There's, there's the account. I'll read part of it, beginning with verse 23 of Matthew 18. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take 
account <clears throat> of his servants. And when he'd begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. And the servant, the servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence, and he laid hands on him, took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. His fellow servant fell in at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I'll pay thee all. And he would not cast him into prison. <clears throat> John Wesley says, The debtor freely and fully pardoned. But he, in turn, willfully and grievously offended, and his pardon retracted. That's what Wesley said. That was his little outline. He was freely and fully pardoned, but he grievously offended, and his pardon was retracted. There is such a thing as heart backsliding. Hey, man, just because we get the blessing of heart wholeness, or perhaps saved and sanctified in this camp meeting. That doesn't mean we haven't made. Thank God the enemy's on the outside. G.D. <clears throat> Watson said that the sinner, devil doesn't pay too much attention to him, just kicks him down in the mud a little farther. But let him climb out of the mud. Let him get out of the fields of sin and get over the fence and into the fields of righteousness. And he's saved and he's born again. G.D. Watson said the battleground moves to the heart. But let him get sanctified and the, the principle of sin purged out, the devil's fifth column in the heart kicked out. Then, Watson said, the battleground moves to the intellect. Amen. He doesn't care. He doesn't care how he detours us if he can just detour us. <clears throat> I know a man that's pastoring up in Canada now. He came from... Emmett, Idaho, and uh, he went to the Pilgrim Holiness School out in California, and uh, <clears throat> he said that family and duties and keeping everything going and being in school, he said there came days when I just had to get away by myself, get alone. Dr. Chapman said, he who is always alone or never alone cannot be a success. Well, there's times I've got to get alone. There's times I don't want to be with anybody. Amen. I love to meditate. Prayer is us talking to God. Meditation is God talking to us. So he said, I got out, would walk the fields, would drive out in the country there in California. And he said, one day I parked my car and climbed a fence and started walking out through a field. And he said, out there I found a, a little abandoned cemetery. And he said, I got to part in the grass and reading the epitaphs and he said, I came to a stone that said, gave a name, and I did know the name, but I've forgotten it or lost it. Name, date of birth, date of death. And then down below it said, a holiness preacher. Oh, he said, I got interested in that. He said, I went back to the school, and then they'd send me out to preach somewhere on a Sunday and said, I'd begin to ask. I'd ask everywhere I went, did you ever hear of a reverend so-and-so? And he said, I finally got discouraged. Nine months went by. You listening? Nine months went by. He said, I just happened one day, he's off in a little church way gone from the school, and he said, I happened to think of it, and I just mentioned the man's name and asked if anybody knew who he was. And after the service, a little white-haired lady came up, walking with the aid of a cane, and said, Reverend, I knew him. And she told him the story. Back in 1895, when Dr. P.F. Brzee founded the Church of the Nazarene, Glory was on in the old barn there in Los Angeles, God everywhere, and he's still pastor of First Methodist Church. I came through Council Bluffs the other day and saw old Broadway Methodist Church with that great steeple. That was the last, that, Dr. Brzee pastored that church and left there and went to California. But uh, they put the pressure on. You gonna stay with that little mission down there? You gonna pastor this church? Well, that little mission where the glory was a fallen, that's where God was. Dr. Brzee left the big Methodist church and chose the little mission. 
He didn't have any plans to start a denomination. He had no more intentions of it. I've read the book of Prince and Israel. He said, I had no intentions, whatever. That's the kind of a leader that I follow. When I find someone that's trying to elbow their way into a job, brother, I wouldn't vote for them under any circumstances. I'm scared to death of the fellows that are trying to open doors and push his way. God was a leading this man. Let him out and... and uh, so uh, he began to, the, the Lord began to put it on him. But the other folks begin to hear about the glory of falling, about God coming, and, and the calls begin to come over. Come over into Macedonia and help us. And he, he, he bumped into this fella. They met. They liked each other. They fellowshiped with each other. They had services. They exchanged pulpits. Finally, they decided maybe that the Lord would be pleased if they'd put together a little bit of a discipline or a manual and get a few rules to go by and so forth. And so they elected delegates and, and they met and everything was going fine until they came to the subject of the piano. My, awful. That old boy said, no, sir. Nope, won't be any piano. And Dr. Brzee said, well, man, said we can. Nope, nope. Devil's in that thing. Dr. Brzee as best he could, backed off and went another way. Well, I can tell by the look on your faces out there when I just mentioned the name P.F. Brzee. A lot of you, you've read about him. You've heard of him. But this man had to search nine months to find this. I don't doubt that he's in heaven. Don't. I'm not questioning that he's in heaven. But I'm telling you that I believe the devil got him off on a track to where it ruined his efficiency, ruined his effectiveness. Over the heads of some folk, the devil would like to have you get some little one-string guitar and just pound that thing and beat that thing and hammer that thing and bless God. And what if we insisted Brother David used a sling? That's the only thing we're going to use as a sling. Gideon used something else. What if we're just going to use what Gideon used? Amen. Some folks are so narrow-minded, if they'd close one eye, you'd mistake them for a needle. Amen. I'm not preaching, I'm not preaching broad mind, not Dr. Broad. No, 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 brother. But there is a way. Do you know this Bible only has the word success in it once? Only once can you find the word success. I like to study words. The words have an impact. You get the meaning of a word and it may change the whole course of a book even. A lot of fellows have missed the one little word, brother, and, and the judge reminded them of them down there. Now at the courthouse, I heard about the fellow that stole the watch. Did you hear about him? He stole the watch. They brought him into court, and they had a jury trial, and the jury was dismissed and came back and said, we find the defendant not guilty. And the judge turned to the accused and said, you're acquitted. He said, does that mean I have to take the watch back? <laughs> oh, yes, a word can have tremendous, tremendous meaning <clears throat> to it. Hey, Amen. Oh, my. Well, I was telling something else, and now it slipped my mind. I was on an illustration. You know, I, <clears throat> I heard the other day how you can tell that you're getting old. First of all, you're, you're forgetful. And then second, let's see, I forget. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I want to get on to this subject of heart backsliding, and I, I didn't know that I'd get into any of that area this morning at all because I feel I have a serious message this morning. Amen. But I do want to remind you that after you get saved and after you get sanctified, the devil's not dead. And if he can get you clear off out in left field of pounding a tambourine or doing something, brother, that, oh, bless God, but you're off the track. Amen. He doesn't care. Oh, I know. I was on that word success. That's where I was. That word success, that... My channel, my one-track mind comes back around. That word success only found once in the Bible. You know where it is? After God took Moses and buried him in a little valley up on the side of the mountain. Came back and, and it had always been Caleb and Joshua, Caleb and Joshua, Caleb and Joshua. God reached right past Caleb and tapped Joshua. And after that, it's Joshua and Caleb, Joshua and Caleb. Caleb didn't take the tuck head because he didn't get elected to the big office. Why? Caleb had the blessing. Amen. While place we seek or place we shun, 
The soul finds happiness in none. But with my God to guide my way, it's equal joy to go or stay. Praise the Lord. Amen. Success. Dr. Truett from Dallas, Texas said success. What is success? Success is knowing the will of God and doing it. And the Lord tapped Joshua and said, I want you to fill Moses' shoes. Brother, I'll tell you, that'd scare the daylights out of anybody, wouldn't it? Moses, me? The Lord said, you. And said, if you turn neither to the left hand nor to the right, but go right down the middle of the road, thou shalt have good success. Don't you go off with that legal crowd. Scrutinizes and just, oh, analyzing everything. Now, don't you go off with that liberal crowd. Good God, good devil, everything good, nothing wrong with anything. You just drive right down the middle of the road. I was preaching the middle of the road in Minnesota one time, and a dear sister came up to me and said, Brother, I want you to know, if you drive down the middle of Minnesota's highways, you'll have a head on. And I said, Sister, I want you to know I'm not talking about the highways of Minnesota. I'm talking about the highway of wholeness, and it's one-way traffic. Brother, I start to cross a bridge with no banisters. I'm going to stay as near in the middle as I possibly can. One side or the other will wreck me. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, backsliding. Let's get on with a lesson here. I read where he said that I remember thee. God's got a memory, got a computer, brother, that I mean he knows. Said, I remember thee. I saw you down there toiling, making bricks. I saw the lash of the taskmasters. I remember thee. And then I remember bringing you out, and I remember you in the wilderness, and you were wholeness unto me, and, and uh, I brought you out of Egypt, and I brought you into the plentiful country. What iniquity have your fathers found in me that they've rejected me and turned away from? That's in that lesson. I read it to you. And he goes on and he finally comes to that 13th verse. He said, my people. Are you listening? My people. He's not talking about the crowd from the pool hall. He's not talking about the crowd at the drive-in theater. He said, my people have committed two evils. Notice now, here's the, here's the pattern. You find it again and again and again and again in Holy Writ. My people have committed two evils. First of all, they have forsaken me. Negative choice. When you start for God, your first choice is a negative choice. It's no to the devil, no to the devil's crowd, no to the buddies, no to the friends, and it's yes to God. Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh, choosing rather negative, positive. But here's the reverse of it, brother. The devil's not asleep and he's not dead and he's certainly not dumb. And so he has them to forsake. Forsake what? The fountain of living waters. Over in the second chapter of Revelation, I read where Jesus commended that church of Ephesus. Brother, marvelous, wonderful commendations. Brother, they could be a part of our crowd. I'll tell you, I'd take that church of Ephesus. But they's on dangerous ground. Why? After 60, 70 years of holding the torch, uh, keeping the standards high, preaching it red hot and sky blue and pure white, the devil had succeeded in getting them to substitute something in the place of Jesus. Oh, when he says, when he says, I have somewhat against thee, thou hast left thy first love. Are you listening? I know that that the emotion enters into it. I know that our enthusiasm enters into it. And, and I know that there's a lot of things in it. But I think the kernel of it is they had forsaken Jesus. They had forsaken Him. They'd forsaken the, the, the angel that's mentioned there, which is Christ. You've left your first love. What is your first love? Brother, I'll tell you, if Jesus is first in your life, everything else will fit into place. And you'll be what you should be. But if Jesus isn't number one, brother, you can shout and hoop and holler or dress or do whatever you want to and you're a misfit. 
Brother, I'll tell you, I like the shout, and that delighted me when that fella came out across here last night and through here like a shot. I nearly stood up and took off after him, and I don't very often do that, but it just did something to me. I like it, but you know why? It's because Jesus was here. Jesus was standing with Paul West as he preached last night. Let me tell you, the devil will be after you, and oh, he's slick, don't you forget it. He's subtle, don't you forget it. He can come at you and come up on the blind side and it'll look so reasonable, but if you could get right down through all the haze and the murk and so forth, you'd find that the kernel of it is he's trying to get you to forsake Jesus. Misplaced faith. I may get on that. I may, the Lord may let me put your message on this, this business right in this area. Substitution. Hey, man, brother, he's going to be first or he isn't going to be anything. God takes her all, doesn't take anything. Devil, he'll take a little bit today and come back tomorrow, just like the communists, you know. <clears throat> They're closely related, devil and the communists. Well, <clears throat> he said, They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and hewed them out cisterns. You know, my father went to, to the place where he established a farm in 1913. Had nothing but yuccas and sagebrush and rattlesnakes and grasshoppers and jackrabbits and he whittled out a farm and built a home and I was born there in 1926 and to keep you from figuring I'm 51 so don't don't go <laughs> but you know one of the first things that my father did was to dig a well brother it was a good one I mean it had the sweetest water I thought it was the best water in the world I'm not so sure but what it is yet my thinking we had a fellow up above us. In fact, I already preached about him yesterday, so I'll not go into that, but he was tight. Oh, tighter than a bark on a tree. He'd call a well driller, driller in, and like some folks at the altar, he'd drill down 500 feet or 50 feet, I don't know how far. They didn't strike water, so he'd pay them off, and they'd go. And they had a sled, and they put a couple of 50-gallon drums on that sled and two horses, and they'd come down to our place. And they'd pump, oh, pump, just pump. That's all we had. We didn't have electricity until 1938. Just pump and pump, pump those two barrels full and carry them back up to their house. And they'd get low, and here they'd come again. And one day, the, their boy came walking down the road going to school, and I got out and started down the road with him, and he began to tell me about their cistern. Brother, I'm telling you, I didn't even know there was such a thing. I'd never even heard of a cistern. We had a well. And he began to brag on that cistern. I tell you why, I had imagination it tasting like Pepsi Cola or Coca Cola or something. It just, the way he was a bragging on that cistern, it just had to be the most. And I just thought about that, and I just looked forward to getting a drink of water out of that cistern. And I remember the day when, when they, that little pitcher pump, you know, going down into that tank, and those troughs along the eaves of the roof, birds and Brother, when I got a sip out of that cistern, I, why, I was never so surprised or shocked in my life. Why, I didn't like it at all. But isn't that just like the devil? You imagine folks are substituting, letting the devil talk them into turning down good, clear, fresh well water for stale, scummy, dirty cistern water. Are you catching on? Well, I'll tell you, the devil's a master. Don't you underestimate him. Don't you think you're a match for him. Brother, I'll tell you, I'm, I, I, I know the verse where Jesus said, Fear not him that's able to destroy the body, but fear him that's able to destroy both body and soul in hell. That's God that's able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Brother, I'll tell you, this whole book tells us we're up against a formidable end. Why, well, you're in trouble if you even carry on a conversation with him. One dear old sister said, you even say, huh, to him, he's got you. Hey, my brother, I'll tell you, resist him in here. Well, <clears throat> let's notice what happened here. He said, my people, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And number two, hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, cracked cisterns that can hold no water. Hey, man. And in that fifth verse, God says, what iniquity. What iniquity have your fathers found in me that they are gone far from me? 
Well, this heart backsliding, how's it happen? I think perhaps the first step, and no doubt you could add a lot of steps to this, or maybe some in between, but there's four that I want to mention to you this morning. And number one is arrested development. Arrested development. A failure to grow. We have six children. Every last one of them, there's come a time when my wife has said, oh, they're at such a cute stage. I wish they could just stay like this for a while. She doesn't. She didn't. Oh, no. We're going somewhere. We're farther on the road where we're going this morning than we were this time yesterday morning. There isn't anything stand still. Arrested development. A failure to grow. Amen. Brother, when that garden, when something seems to happen and it just stays at a certain stage, it's not dead, but it doesn't grow. It doesn't move on towards, towards uh, its maturity and towards the production of fruit and so forth. It just, it just seems to be stalemated. I don't know if anybody escapes the stalemate stage somewhere, sometime in their spiritual life. Oh, the devil, I'll tell you, he's out to stop us if he can. He's subtle, he's slick about it. He won't offer you a camel cigarette. No, 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 no. He, why, he's not even smoking cigarettes. I think he's stro stroking those long wings of his uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and doing everything he can to make you think he's an angel of light. Arrested development. Oh, my. Adam Clark says apostasy begins in the closet. What do you mean? Failure to get into the secret place of prayer. Failure to get along with this old black book and read it. One of the brethren said, whether, whether it, whether it, uh, whether it uh, is interesting or not, why, there's times I read it and I can't get one thing out of it. What do I do? I keep right on reading. I'm not operating by feeling. I'm delighted when the feeling comes, but when the feeling doesn't come, I just keep right on anyway. Hey, man, just keep right on putting one foot in front of the other. Hey, man, feeling or no feeling, I'm headed for heaven. I'm headed for the city. Hey, man, I've set my course. Lots of different emotions come. Waves of the sea, winds blow and so forth. What do you do? Jesus said to that crowd, when they're talking about John the Baptist, said, what came you out for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? Reed in Scripture symbolizes weakness. Brother, I'll tell you, old John wasn't any weakling. Oh, he thundered home the message of repentance. Amen. Arrested development. Apostasy begins in the closet. Oh, yes. I heard about the little old boy riding his bicycle, and the fellow was in a phone book. He used to go around and around and around and around and around, and the little old boy hit his brake and skidded his bike to a stop and said, Hey, mister, said, close the door and the light comes on. If you can get the door shut to the prayer closet, the light generally comes on. But it's the inability to get the door shut. Oh, I haven't tended to the chickens. Oh, the grass needs to be mowed. Oh, the spare tire's flat. I've got to take care of it. Oh, I mustn't forget it today. Who reminds you of those things? Isn't it amazing how concerned the devil is about your affairs? What about that flat tire? 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 Hey, man. Oh, yes. Well, I've even got to write notes to myself. I even keep a diary. I wish I'd have kept one from the beginning of my ministry, Brother Manziel. Amen. But I'll tell you, there's some things that are first. The tires are flat and the grass go, grows knee high and, and there's a lot of things happening. And the chickens just squawk and squall and so forth. Brother, I've got to have my time of prayer. I've got to have my time of reading this old black book. I've got to refuel. I read in the second chapter of Acts where they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Brother, they came out of that upper room like a dynamo. I'll tell you, Peter, Peter preached, brother, to that crowd that their throats were still sore from crying, Crucify him! Crucify him! And here now, they're crying, What must we do to be saved? 
Strike the stoutest sinner through. Start the cry, what shall we do? Through the land. <laughs> hey, man. Oh, yes. Well, this, uh, this arrested development business, this failure to grow, this failure to develop. I had a school chum, and uh, he was staying with, he's a farm boy, but he was staying with his uncle and aunt in town. And one day he said, I want you to come home to dinner with me. I said, oh, no. I said, that isn't your parents. That's your uncle and aunt. Oh, I said, I want you to come. They, they won't matter. I wouldn't go. Well, <clears throat> he talked to them, and they said, why, yes, you bring, bring your friend home. We'd be glad to have him. So they set up a time for me to come, and I went. This man was a retired railroad man. He met me on the porch and screened in porch. So, so, so courteous. Just set me at ease. The wife came from the kitchen, and I was introduced to her, and uh, they were so gracious. And we sat down on the porch there and, and uh, began to carry on the conversation. That old man just conversed with us, and I just thoroughly enjoyed it. I just relaxed. After a while, the lady called for the meal, and we stepped into the dining room and then on into the, or the living room and on into the dining room, and I stopped dead in my tracks. There was something. He's 22 years old. He was strapped into a huge homemade high chair. He had a beard that was possibly three quarters of an inch long. He had the mind of a six weeks old baby. I could hardly eat my meal. The guttural sounds and the carrying ons. You can just imagine the actions and the motions of a six week old baby. And here that thing, 250 pounds. His father had to strap him in time to shave him, and it was such an ordeal, such a battle that he, he didn't do it until he just had to do it again. What's the matter? Failure to develop. When that baby was born, the doctor detected nothing wrong. And for six weeks, it looked like everything was, in fact, long after six weeks, they didn't realize. But the time came when they realized that something was wrong, and they began to go from specialist to specialist, and and then finally, it caved in. Oh, I've seen individuals start out so well. It looked like they were a-going. It looked like they were going to make it. But the devil was able to insert something. It doesn't have to be very much. I remember after God got me on the course and I was called to preach. I mean, I was enthused about this thing. I just a loving God and a loving the church and I'd forgot all about the world and, and why I was just, the delight of my heart was to get to church and to hear my pastor preach. And when revival came, brother, I'll tell you, that was just dessert. I was just there within, with barrels on, with enthusiasm. Prayer meetings and all. And I was out knocking doors and trying to get new folks in and so forth. And we lived in a little old house. And uh, this old gentleman let us rent that place for me milking the cows at night. And I was out milking those cows one night. And while I was uh, sitting there and milking and thinking and praying, God whispered to me and said, Son, Sunday morning, I want you to say amen out loud. Well, now I want you to know. There wasn't anybody more bashful than Lowell Foster. If someone told me back there that I'd be a preaching up on a platform and preach to a congregation like this, brother, my heart had to quit. Oh, you never found me, I tell you, and I'm still not over it. There's times, brother, I just, I mean, I'd rather be anywhere nearly than to be in some of the places that I have to, that I'm required to go. Just a natural trait. God doesn't, God doesn't remove the natural out of us. Brother, I mean, that jarred me. Say, man, out loud. What are you talking about? I'm talking about arrested development. I wouldn't be some fo a bit surprised that some folks have, are in spiritual trouble. Spiritual indigestion from swallowing amens. Right here in this camp meeting. God put it on you to express yourself and you swallowed instead of getting it out. Well, I picked out... Denver Cox back there, the first time I saw him in the service. I, well, I, I knew he was here before I saw him. I couldn't pick him out for a little bit. I was looking around where that deep hallelujah was a coming from. I talked to him last night. God talked to him about that. Don't you ever quit it. You're having to make up for a lot of folks that, that God would like to get out and like to stir this thing loose. 
God's looking for lightning rods in every service where he can, his lightning can strike a service and, and accomplish what he wants to do. And too many folks have got their lightning rods turned down like this. What are your lightning rods? Brother, that's God. That's the faith line. Old Dr. J.G. Morrison said, get your, get your, uh, your, your faith lines up there. Said the devil, knock them down. Get them back up there where God's lightning can strike them. Arrested development. A lot of services that turn off dead and sour. And the preachers put everything he's had into it. He's prayed. He's come prepared. And he's delivered his soul. Someone sitting in a pew that could have turned the thing around with maybe just one amen. You talking about, I'm talking about arrested development. Brother, we're going somewhere. Oh, that was a battle for me. I mean, I don't even remember finished milking that cow or milking the next one. I don't remember much about going to work that day. On my mind, all my all day long. My, my, that was Thursday. Oh, oh, amen. I've got to say amen Sunday morning. Brother, the pastor we had, you could say amen anywhere in the defeat. Oh, my. I mean, Saturday, my wife said, what's the trouble? Nothing. Sunday morning came. Boy, I... Went off to service. I'll tell you, I wasn't, I wasn't very enthusiastic that morning. We never know what's going on. We never dream, brethren, preachers. We never dream what we'll face. And many times the service comes and goes, and we still don't have any idea of what we faced in that service. It doesn't have to be murder. It doesn't have to be a great sin. No, no, no. I'm talking about failure to develop. Climbing, climbing, and all of a sudden begin to level out and, and start the decline, and you can hardly detect it. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing. He shall continue to receive the blessing again and again and again and again. That second chapter of Acts they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Brother, by the fourth chapter, I'll tell you, the devil was a raging. All hell was turned loose. Peter was in jail. They went to prayer, and the place was shaken where they prayed, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. I thought they were filled in the second chapter. They were, but they got a refilling. A lot of folks are trying to operate on batteries, but the generator's gone haywire. Reservoirs got so little water into the dipper just scrapes the bottom when they dip into it. Brother, God wants you to refill that reservoir. God wants you to bring that battery up to a quick charge, to, to a full charge, to where when the buttons push, brother, there's fireflies. One of the most sickening things that ever happens to me is to hit that, that key, turn that key and click, click, click. I was in Emmett once, cold Saturday night. That old blue Ford pickup I had. And I went down to Sprouse Rights. And I met you down there one day. I don't know if it was this time or not, but I went down there. And why, wow, that thing had just been working perfect. Came back out and click, click. Well, I knew that battery shouldn't be haywire. Well, I hadn't had it that long. That's all I did. You click. And I was sitting wondering what to do. And the old boy next beside me said, you having trouble? And I said, yeah, my, that thing just clicks. And I demonstrated for him, or the car did. I turned the key and it demonstrated. Click. I've seen some folks demonstrate just about like that. Uh, we get to that place in the service, you know, and you try to turn the key, and it's just click, click, click. It's a sickening feeling, whether it's in an Oldsmobile or in a church pew. Hey, man. That old boy opened up his trunk and pulled out some tools, and wasn't long till he pulled those cables off. And there was that dull, dirty, gray, blackish material that had got in there. Brother, I tell you, he had a wire brush affair, and he slipped that down over one of those posts, and if that old post could have talked and said, Oh, oh, ouch, ouch, oh, oh, my, careful, that's tender. But he just twisted and twisted and twisted, and brother, when he pulled off there, that lead just shined. Man, he moved over to the other post. I don't know whether he's on the negative or the positive, but he moved over to the other one, and he let it have it. He just, look, if that thing could have, oh, stop, stop. Amen. Oh, a lot of folks, they just think all this is just 
ice cream and pie and delight and so forth. Brother, I tell you, God gets a fellow down every once in a while and he uses the sandpaper. And he occasionally comes across a knot that sandpaper won't touch. And he gets one of those big old wood rasps, brother. And I mean, he just starts right down and, and you're saved and sanctified too. Perfection's not attained at that point at which nothing else can be added. But perfection's attained at that point at which nothing else can be subtracted. I want to say that again. Perfection's not attained at that point at which nothing else can be added. But perfection's attained at that point at which nothing else can be subtracted. Amen. Oh, yes. We can reach that perfect state when we've, when we've emptied ourselves. That's the negative aspect of the work of heart holiness is the cleansing, the purging. reason more folks aren't filled, they've never been emptied. And when God gets everything out, and he knows, he doesn't take it out piece by piece either, but it comes out in a chunk. We may have a long time of seeing the chunk. We may have a long time, but when we see enough of it, brother, to where we recoil from that thing, and Wesley said, you never see all of it, it'd kill a fella. I heard about the boys up on the side, and they was rolling snowballs around, and they found a big old chunk of dirty black wood mud, and goop all over it and they put that down in the snow and begin to roll it and roll it and roll it and finally get up as big as they did and they rolled it over down over a hill and it just picked up and just kept on going and rolled and finally leveled out right down by the road sun came out melted the snow there's that big old snowball folks drop the drive by and said pretty look how white and isn't it beautiful that old sun kept a melting kept a melting and all of a sudden there's something stuck out it wasn't so beautiful and that old sun kept a boring down and got little more of it exposed and so forth. And finally, folks had to climb in the thing. Old chunk of dirty wood with gum all over it. Clear on the inside. Amen. Perfection. What was it? Isaiah said, Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white. But the psalmist said, Whiter than. God take that chunk of wood, all the dirt out. Perfection not attained at that point which nothing else can be added. But perfection is attained at that point which not. Brother Parker Maxey, maybe he told that when he was here. But he told about when he was an 18-year-old boy, just come out of that TB sanitarium and some folks in that little town of Emmett where I pastored eight years. Daddy was dead and he had nowhere to go. And this old couple took him in. And Sunday morning they went to church and Brother Parker was in the altar seeking holiness. And he prayed through, a professor prayed through that morning. That old gentleman, while his wife was fixing dinner, that old gentleman took Parker out to the garden. And he had a row of cabbage that went clear through his garden. And up at the upper end of the garden was cabbage fully developed. In fact, the old gentleman pulled his jackknife out and reached down and clipped the head out. And then he went down and here was some that he'd planted later and it wasn't, it wasn't as far along. As, and then some that he'd planted even still later and it had, wasn't as far. And got clear on down and there was some that they just two little old leaves to stick into. The old gentleman said, now Brother Max, it's all cabbage. It's pure cabbage. He said, this is where you are. You're down there, just a little suit, just through and it's it not some weed it's not a pig weed or a canadian weed or something no it's cabbage pure cabbage has got a, there's a difference between purity and, and that's what i'm talking about this morning is this developing business after you pass up the crisis points after you get the sin question settled both in transgression and and uh, on the inside the acquired depravity and the inherited depravity and you get it you settle it it's out but you just started amen difference between purity and maturity. Perfection not attained at that point at which nothing else can be added. Why, bless your heart, I tell you, I just delight to, to rub shoulders and rub elbows uh, with these old white-haired saints. Well, there isn't any real bone in me. I'm not too excited about the whiz kids. Some places, all oh, they want just the youth, you know, just the young bucks. And, well, I like youth, and I like the enthusiasm and the vigor and the fire of youth, and we need it. Brother, I like the counsel of those who have fought battle after battle and trial after trial and test after test. Brother, I'll tell you, I can pick something up from them that maybe will keep me from having to go through and suffer some scars if I can listen to the wisdom that they have. Hey, Amen. Oh, my, my, my. Arrested development. Another place to devil really hooks on to folks is over this offering business. Blessed quietness. Amen. Tithe. Just because you decide and settle it, 
like God saves you and sanctifies you and bless God, you start right out of putting 10% of all that comes in. Some folks figured out to a, down to a, to a gnat's track nearly. They just, this is the Lord and then this is the Lord. Well, they'll give God the benefit of the doubt. If it comes out so many dollars and 76 cents, go on to the next dollar. You'll never get ahead of him anyway. We're debtors. We'll be debtors till we die throughout eternity. Amen. I'll tell you, you get on that dollar sign, brother, and you get a lot of folks on hook. Oh, my, 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 my. Get that pocketbook on the altar. We got some brothers in our church, brother. I'll tell you, they ain't I mean, they can make that old buffalo squirrel. Now, buffalo, we don't have them anymore, but I mean, they, ooh, they know how to pinch those things. They know where every one of them goes. I had an old German Jew one time tell me, he run a Marshall Wells store in this Oregon. He said, the Reverend, he said, I look out for the pennies and the dollars. Brother, I'll tell you, that's exactly the way he operated. And there's nothing wrong with that. God wants us to use our head. He'd like to have us plan and save a little bit and have a home and so on. God is not against that. But oh, get liberal with him. Young folk, don't you, don't you follow the example of someone that's been tight-fisted and argued and fussed over every dime the church spent. Some folk feel like they're a special guardian. And the first thing that's suggested, the first thing that comes up, where's the money coming? I learned a long time ago, you can't operate everything by the end of a pencil. Faith comes into this business. Brother Faith told me on the platform, he said, well, he said, I had to borrow again to pay my pledges. Why not? We borrow to buy a Buick, don't we? I've heard folks say, oh, I don't believe in pledging. I don't believe it's scriptural. I don't believe God pleased for us to pledge. But brother, when they decide to buy a home, when they decide to buy an automobile, when they decide to buy a piece of farm equipment or something, brother, they can pledge. I'll tell you, they'll sit down with that old banker, brother, and I mean they get their pen out and they just figure it right down. Hey, yes, Mr. So-and-so, I believe I can meet that. And so much a month, yes. And the interest, yes, that, that's agreeable. And he, the old banker fills out a form, brother, and let me tell you, he doesn't fail to dot an I cross a T either. He may be congenial and personality plus and so forth, but he fills out that piece of yellow paper in detail and then the government you know they make him make it in three and and he gets three and there's two carbons in there and so forth and you sign on the bottom line and brother i tell you talk about pledging whoa here where am i hooked up yeah i'm hooked up on pledging thank you brother well that's where a lot of folks are hooked up well i looked out over this crowd when brother manzel mentioned yesterday something about a, a day's wages a day's wages uh, a day's wages. Heard about the old boy that got saved, you know, and oh, the Lord did such a good job, and he just delighted in paying his tithe, and God began to bless him, brother, and his boss liked him, and his, he got raise after raise and raise after raise, and kept it going up and kept it going up, and till finally, brother, I'll tell you why his tithe was more than what his paycheck used to be. Oh, he got to looking at that and thinking about that, and finally went to the pastor. I've got a problem. And so he explained that to the pastor, said, you see, here, say, I, I'm, I'm, here's what I'm making, and my, look what my tithe said, you mean God, really, really, God wants 10 per pastor said, I only can see one solution, and that is to bring your salary back down to where you're not paying so much tithe. Oh, no, 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 I don't. Hey, man, I've got four points, but I'm just on the first one, brother Paul. <laughs> The everlasting gospel, arrested development, a failure to grow, a failure to keep step with God. I heard Brother J. E. Ray, one of our fellows, tell years ago how that his daddy down in Oklahoma, he was the youngest of the boys, and his daddy kicked them all out in the morning and said, Okay, boys, chores. He said, My job was to take the lantern, light it, and then walk off out there in the cow lot and get all the old cows up. He said, You know, as I'd walk out there in the darkness of the morning, carrying that old lantern he said there was just a circle of light all the way around you catching on but he said supposing i set that light down brother he'd soon be out in darkness wouldn't he light would be back there and he'd be off out here somewhere stumbling around oh yes walk while you have light if we walk in the light 
If we walk in the light, the ifs on our part, the contingencies on our part, the absolutes on God's part, if we walk in the light, he will do his part. That wall's contingent. That's solid. You don't go moving that wall over there. That door's contingent. You can close it or have it at half mast or open it wide up or whatever you want. That door represents the human. That wall represents God. The if is always on our part. Biggest word in the English language, if. Amen. Arrested development. Get to the place to where we like to have things quieted down a little. Bless your heart. We've come up the road. We're moving a better class of people now. Don't miss it. The other morning I missed something about doctors and lawyers. I'd like to get every doctor and lawyer saved I can get. Brother, I'll tell you, it doesn't seem to me like the gospel has too much effect on gospel, on doctors and lawyers. They know too much. They think they know too much. Bud Robinson, we're not immune. Brother, I'll tell you, there were men in that church that bled and died. Old Dr. J.B. Chapman drove a little old Willis automobile. When he died, he had $2.65 in his pocket. He didn't have a refrigerator. Everything that old gentleman had, brother, went right back into the church. He was all out. He preached that message just before he died, all out for souls. And I've had many a man tell me that the tears were stripping, dripping off of his chin and down onto his clothes and he preached uh, the old man with the anointing of God on him. But all the time those old gentlemen and those fellows were trying to hold the line and you know what I'm talking about. There were those that were doing everything they could to tear down and to liberalize and to bring in modern innovations and so forth and legalize TV and all the rest of it. We've all gone through the same fight and the same battle. Let me tell you, the battle's still on. That's what I'm preaching about this morning. My people, my people, my people have committed two evils. First, they've rejected me. Second, they've hewed them out. Said, you can't just reject Christ. Brother, the devil fixed fit a pickaxe into your hand and he'll have you in the hardest granite you ever got into brother trying to chip out something trying to chip out a cistern in solid rock when there's a fountain flowing and uncle bud came into one of these churches they had one of these dignified fellas you know he'd been to seminary and i'm for education i'm for all that a fella can get i'm not making any any reflection if you can keep god but he did things decently and in order six foot icicle behind the pulpit and snow all over the pews brother you talk about cold you talk about frigid first church of the frigid air you know and uncle bud was traveling and he stopped at a hotel before midnight on saturday night and he slept in a little late and then he got there just as the sunday school classes were coming back and it was a large church and he thought he'd just slip in and get back in the audience and then just be in the service and enjoy the service but someone spied him and sent word up to the pastor. And he said, I believe I see Brother Robbins. We would like to have Brother Robinson word to come forward and lead us. Uncle Buddy come ambling down that aisle, Brother, I tell you. His knees hit the floor about four foot from the altar and he crawled the rest of the way in. He was in contact with the glory world and he prayed a hole through the sky. He didn't note that they were. And it's all right, I'm not done. But when they quit kneeling all together and standing all together, there's something wrong. He didn't notice that they were standing, and he sure didn't notice the embarrassment of the pastor. Awful. Brother, I'll tell you, Bud prayed and the glory fell. He just got blessed nearly to death, forgot where he was, lost his identity. Finally got up, brother, a wife in his eyes and heading back down the aisle of hunting for it nearly. And the pastor said, Brother Robinson, Brother Robinson just wants to remind you that God's not dead. No, it's a, but he's here a long way from this place. What are you talking about? Talking about arrested development. Brother, we better keep the fire on. We better keep the glory on. We better keep God. We better keep victory. Don't you blame the pastor altogether. I know the leader has a tremendous impact. But I'll tell you, when laymen are a scotchman and a back in the preacher, brother, he'll preach way beyond himself. We're in this thing together. It isn't the pastor by himself, and it isn't the lady by herself. Brother, it's, it's a twofold proposition. We work together. Brother, I'll tell you, if God can get folks, uh, why, if he can get them lined up, 
I don't read where the scripture says he can take a worm and whip mountains. I preached that a while back. Someone said, where did you get that? It's in the Bible. It is not. I've read the Bible through. It's in the 41st chapter of Isaiah. God said he'd take a worm and whip a mountain. Brother, if he can do that, he can do anything. I've seen some mountains that Caterpillar couldn't face. Amen. Well, maybe I better hurry on something else here. I've preached about prayer, and I've preached about tithe and offering, and I've preached about keeping the glory down. Over in the 107th Psalm, four different times, David said, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. He tells about those that go down to the sea in ships and how the storm comes and they tossed and tossed until they are at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord. I call that wit's end praying. Brother, that's real prayer. Wit's end prayer. That's what we need in the churches. When old Nebuchadnezzar said, Boys, if you don't tell me what my dream was, your heads are coming off. Daniel's one of those wise fellows, you know. They got word to Daniel. Daniel wanted to know what the haste was. And he and the three Hebrew boys went to prayer. Brother Tidwell said, no doubt that was one time of sincere intercession. I guess so if your heads are coming off if you don't pray through and get something, brother. Amen. Sincere intercession. That's what we need. That desperation. That desperation that gets a hold that won't let go. I've heard some desperation prayer, some desperation agony in this camp. We need more of it. Let's don't decline towards Thursday. Let's take the incline. Well, my second point, and I don't think I'll ever get through, but second, we lose Godward ambitions. First, arrested development. We're inclining, and then we, and then we start to level off. Oh, that's a dangerous spot. Lose Godward ambitions. Revelation chapter 2. Some folks read that, that thou hast lost thy first love. That isn't what he said. He didn't say that. He said thou hast lost left. There's a difference between losing and leaving. If I lose something, I'm looking for it. What, what did I do with that? I had it. What did I do with that? But when we leave something, thou hast left. What was it? As Jesus. You may disagree with me. You may think it's emotion. You may think it's first love. And it is first love. Brother, my wife and I have been married 30 years. We don't act like we did 30 years ago. My mother-in-law said love is blind, but the neighbors ain't. But uh, we don't act like we did, but we're still in love. Amen. Oh, yes. Lose Godward ambitions. Light becomes indistinct. Things that we once believed, we begin to question now. We begin to doubt. I, I wonder if that's exactly what it means. I heard about the fella that... His children had gone off to school and came home and said, Oh, Dad, you're a back number. Why, it's not like that anymore, Dad. You need to come on into the 20th century. You need to move up, Dad. It's not like that anymore. Come out of the horse and buggy days, Dad. Brother Dad had had a sound conversion. And subsequent to that, he'd had a wonderful baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. And it had held across the years. And he'd prayed his way through many a battle. And he'd kept the victory and kept God. But now his own flesh and blood are wearing. And one night the old gentleman dreams. And in his dream, he's a carrying a heavy cross. And it is cumbersome. And it is awkward. And it is heavy. And it is burdensome. And he thinks, oh, if I could just cut off. And in his dream, suddenly there's a, there's a cross-cut saw laying right by the road, by a rock. And he drops that heavy cross over that rock, takes that saw and measures off 24 inches of the leg and then picks it up. It's so much. My, I believe I can bear this. It's so much bad. Begins to bear it, but he goes just a little ways and he hears water. And he stops, and, or tries to stop, but there's an invisible hand pushing and and the hands and the voice, he said, what is it? What is that? And the voice said, this is the river. Of... But, but how do I get across? How do I get to the other side? Ah, that's what the cross is. You use the cross that you have to bridge the cast. Oh, but, but what if it's too wide? Ah, but the Lord knew where you would cross. And he gave you a cross accordingly. It'll fit. It's far enough across. It'll go over. He knows about the two feet that's laying back 
What have you cut off? What have you left back up the trail that God put on you back there? Let me tell you, first convictions are best convictions. God told me something because he knows my makeup. And he put some slats in the fence. And if I deliberately kick those slats out, I'm in trouble because the devil can come in right at that slat. I see other folks, he didn't put the same slats in. Why? They have a different makeup than I do. He puts the same slats for all as far as the illegitimate is concerned, but when it comes to the legitimate. Well, there's a vast variety in there. There's things I cannot do, but others do. I don't condemn them. I don't even think about it. That's over the heads of some folks, but not over everybody's head this afternoon afternoon yet. Brother, he dropped that cross, and it just barely caught the other side, and, oh, that hand was a-pushing, and gingerly he steps out, uh, and he takes one, two, three steps, and it caves off on the other side, and he screams and starts down, awakens from his dream. The sweat popped out on his forehead. He dropped beside the bed and said, Oh, God, I care not what my children say. I'll stay by the old path. I'll stay by the old truth. I will not slack up. I'll keep my Godward ambitions. Man, the reason why God told you some things, told me some things at a mourner's bench, and if I ever let go of them, I'm not telling you what they are. I may touch on some in the course of a message, but... Well, those are mine. They're individual. I'm not measuring myself by others. I read where Paul said, measuring myself by others, by myself. He said, I'm a fool that I'm not wise. Man, lose Godward ambitions. Oh, my. Well, I heard a great preacher years ago. He came out to our section of the country and preached the camp. He's from this country, from this area, this, this vast area. And he told him the course of the camp that he'd never seen the Pacific Ocean. And one of my friends, in fact, a close friend of mine, went to him after service and said, do you have any time? I said, I've got four days after this camp. He said, if you will, he said, we'll leave the next morning after this camp closes and I'll take you to the Oregon coast. Beautiful coast. He said, I'll show you the Pacific. They left early on a Monday morning. And that evening, as the sun was beginning to head towards the horizon, they arrived. And this friend of mine, described as that great preacher, climbed out of that car. He had a newspaper under his arm. He walked towards the pounding surf of the Pacific Ocean. He'd look this way, and he'd look that way, and he'd glance out towards the ocean and towards that setting sun. And this fellow said, I stood off to one side and just watched. He said he looked and looked, and after a while, the disk of that orb seemed to sink into the water and gradually kept going lower and lower and lower until the last ray disappeared behind the blue of the Pacific. Suddenly that man yelled or screamed and said, Look! Look! It's just as light as it was before the sun disappeared. I can still read my newspaper. I can still see you as distinctly. I can still see everything as distinct." There's no wonder why a lot of folks said we're just like we were 40 years ago. Why we still have the light. We still are walking in the light. But the sun has gone. They're walking in the twilight. And the dusk is coming on. And following the dusk will be darkness. And they'll be moving in darkness. And how dark that darkness will be. The devil doesn't just... He doesn't just flip her all of a sudden, just like you throw a switch on the wall and it's all light and then all of a sudden dark. Brother, we'd fight and scream our way out of that. You're not going to do that to me, old devil. Not on your life. Brother, I'm going with God and we'd wake up. But it comes so subtly, so slowly, and the dusk, and we imagine it's just like it used to be when it's not like it used to be. We've cooled off. We've let down. We've slowed up. Uh, and yet the devil's a savin' us. Uh, and it's all right, son. All right, daughter. Don't, don't get stirred. Don't you let that man say excite you. Don't you let Paul West get you all stirred up. You're just like you were 25 years ago. You're all right. You're all right, son, daughter. Don't. It's all right. But you're already in the twilight. And the dark darkness is coming. Lose Godward ambitions. I'll hurry on and give you these last two. The third is, we begin to go over the checks of the Holy Ghost deliberately. Brother, God turns the, the flashing blue lights on. The siren begins to scream. We shut our jaws 
That's horse and buggy stuff. Yeah, they used to preach that back there, but, brother, I know Dr. So-and-so, and, and I know old sister so-and-so, and they're just, brother, there, I'll tell you, they love God, and, and they're not a-going along with this business. Amen. Oh, yes. Go over the text of the Holy Ghost. That general alarm in the soul. Well, there'd have been a time the first wail of the siren would have stretched us out flat, and we'd been a screaming and a crying, Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Now there's defiance. Amen. Oh, I've seen it enacted. I've seen, the, I've seen this thing enacted in real life before me so many times. Brother, I can think of folks, some of the best people, some of the most godly men and women, brother, they love God. They put everything they had into it. But I'll tell you, the devil slicked them. You think you're smarter than he is, you're mistaken. I haven't got over yet that Saturday, that preacher, 28 years on the Idaho, Oregon district, uh, eight of them under Brother Glenn Griffith. I'd heard about Dick Jackson. I'd heard about him again and again and again. Never had seen him until a few weeks in Denver, Colorado. Cancer. He got bitter because of some things that happened in the church. Let me tell you, there are going to be things happen. There'll be things happening this next month. That if you let the devil, he'll have you all soured up and turn you critical. And what's the matter with that president of ours? What's the matter with the pastor? What's the matter with the neighboring pastor? What's the matter with that board? What's wrong with that committee? Do you mean to tell us, Brother Parker, you agree with everything that comes out? Oh, no. I'm just as human as you are. I'm just sure my way is the best way if folks could just see it. Hey, man. Brother, I'm not going to take the tuck head over procedure. I said before, he turned the pews around. I'm not going to fuss or fight or spew. I don't know how it'd be to have you all facing the other way me up here preaching in that direction, but I, I don't know. But uh, I'm not going to backslide over, over something like that. Hey, man. Oh, my. Well, I'm just getting geared up here. Just it's really getting a going, it seems like. But let me tell you, this it's only a step. Are you listening? It's only a step from questioning holiness standards to questioning holiness standards doctrine. It's only a step from questioning holiness standards to questioning holiness doctrine. And brother, I've seen it where it's been a mighty short step. We've got some folks in our area that were members of the same church that I grew up in. Had, were exposed to the same preachers and the same preaching. Had the same standards. Years. Years of it. Why? Brother, they tell you they're still saved and saved. Well, they've got those, their hair all bobbed off. When I was unsaved, what went into service, went into revival service one night, sat in the back, defiant. Pastor had a wooden leg. He used to pastor pay at Idaho. I'm walking down that aisle, looked me in the eye and said, young man, you've got the marks of hell on your face. Didn't go to the altar. That didn't go over all. It just made me mad, really. Oh, I got out. It there was there was an effect. It scared me all right. And I I'm not I got straightened out. And I got into the same area where he came just came for revival and went on. But I remembered him. And then I got acquainted with him out there. And then when we stepped out and left the compromise, left all of the business that going on and so forth, brother, I'll tell you, he built the fence so high. I really believe that there's come times when he's looked longingly and he'd like to climb the fence, but he built the fence. He made so many rabbits. Oh, thou hast forsaken me. Huge sister. Go over the checks of the Holy Ghost. That flashing light, that warning, stop, stop. Old Sam Jones used to say, when God says, whoa, you better stop. Brother, folks get to the place to where they can't hear it or don't understand it. They take the bit in their teeth and off the... But the last that I mentioned quickly has become a fault finder. A fault finder. Amen. Oh, sour, critical. Bitter, harsh. Amen. We used to have a sign in the church where I, what I attended. It said a knocker never boosts and a booster never. Amen. Oh, yes. A long time ago, a professor stood before his class and he wept. And the theological students sat for a little while and finally they said, Professor, Professor, why do you weep? And that professor said, Today, theologians are picking at obscure scriptures in the Old Testament. He said, I fear, 
I see the day when Christendom will largely deny the authenticity, deny the virgin birth of the deity of Christ. Where did it start? It started with obscure scriptures in the Old Testament. Folks didn't think too much about it, maybe didn't even realize that there was anything perhaps possibly maybe a little bit mixed up there. So they kept hammering away that this this isn't just as it should be. And they kept hammering away and kept hammering away and kept hammering away until finally they begin to get the ear of some orthodox men that really weren't too fervent in spirit. And, and the day came, brother, when the pendulum swung. Brother, you can get anything you want today. And it's called scripture. There's the devil. And then, brother, we've got a fellow that speaks for multiplied millions of Americans. And there's folks in the wholeness church that send him money and boost and laud him to the skies. And his name is Billy. And he is as phony. See, the wholeness movement backing denies the authenticity of the scripture, denies any opposition to communism, godless, anti-God communism. Well, they brought out just recently that he's got a slush fund that's 20-some million dollars. That's really made him squirm. Hey, Amen. Oh, yes. You ever hear him preach, Brother Foster? Yes, I've heard him preach. Brother, he can preach on some lines. But he's like the cow that we had when I was a boy. Brother, I mean, she could fill a bucket clear full, but almost invariably she'd kick it over before you could get I've heard him say some things that, brother, they were, they were just tremendous. And at the end, he'd kick the bucket and everything. And as Brother Paul West says, I felt that go home and it didn't go over with ever. But I wouldn't be faithful if I didn't, and I don't very often bring personalities into my mind. Brother, we'd better wake up as holy folk. I've even found holy folk sending money off to oral robber. Oily robber, you know. Those fingers dripping oil. No telling where those fingers have been. Well, praise the Lord. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. Hewed them out cisterns. Broken cisterns that can hold no water. Praise the Lord. Oh, aren't you glad God can put something in you to just keep you going? Dear old Brother Tidwell, he told me one time, he said, Brother Foster, Brother Foster, he said, blessings or cursings? He said, I just keep, so they bless me, he said, I just keep it going. Some folks you bless, you know, they're kind of like a cat, you know, they kind of, they like that, you know, they just, Brother Tidwell said, blessings or cursings? He said, I just keep the same pace, just keep it going. Curse me, he said, I just keep step. Some folk run, you curse them, you know. Ooh, just, brother, brother, they get, they're ready to go down to Fist City. Oh, God, you're not going to say that about me. Brother Tidwell said, blessings or cursings? I just keep the same pace. Hey, man. Oh, Bob Schuler out in California took FDR on back in 1938. Put him in jail. He had so many bootleggers in Los Angeles County in jail and so many in trouble that Franklin Delano even reached out and they put Bob Schuler in jail. Did you know that? Uncle Bud Robinson was, was to preach at the Methodist uh, uh, Conference in Dallas, Texas that united, reunited the South and the North churches of the Methodist Church. Uncle Bud was to preach one night and Bob Schuler preached the next night. Bud got up and said, folks, he said, I want you to all stand. And he said, we're going to pray for Bob Schuler. Said, he's in jail out in Los Angeles. And said, he's to preach here tomorrow night. And said, God can get him out and get him on a plane. And Bud prayed a little old simple prayer. And the next night, Bob Schuler preached from that book. Bob Schuler told about those days when the devil was frightened. Brother, he had a lantern jaw on him. I've got a picture of Bob Schuler. I used to get the Methodist Challenge. Brother, I'll tell you, there was fire and thunder in that, in that paper. Hadn't published since 1960, but I got a stack of them that thick. I refer back to them. He's a fighter. And I'll tell you, in the fight, you get, you get sometimes to where you just, well, you don't know which way to go or what to do, and, and you need something. God's always got something. And old Bob Shooter said, I was back in the back of my house in my study, and it was hot, and I was sweaty, and the devil was fighting, and the mosquitoes and all, and he said, the Lord whispered, said, get, get out of here. Then I get up and walked back through the house, and my wife looked at me and said, I walked on out and out on the front porch. And he said, I sat down on the front porch. One of those chain affairs, you know. But all of a sudden, I heard a commotion. He said, I looked, and he said, past the end of my house 
become the biggest old white bulldog you talk about. And had that old boy where he couldn't back up any further and had let him have it right in the nose. Oh, said he was ugly. And said those front legs are just about like that. And said that old bulldog brother, he was a coming around the corner of the house and went right in front of my house. He said, I came out of that seat and behind him was a little old terrier. <laughs> said that old bulldog with you, brother. He wasn't paying any more attention to that terrier than he was the man in the moon. Said that old bulldog was just a going right on down that sidewalk, brother, and that little old tank. <laughs> Bob Shooter said, I stood like a general in review. And he said, I watched as that dog, those two dogs passed by. And he said, long after I couldn't see him anymore. He said, I, I stepped out to see him before. He said, I, I could still hear him. He said, as long as I could hear that little terrier, I listened. And when I couldn't hear anymore, he said, I turned and knelt beside that old swing rocker and said, oh, God, give me a double portion of that bulldog spirit. I heard about the fellow start for town and stopped by his neighbor back in days gone by and said, come on, neighbors, go to town. He said, I can't go yet. said, I've, I've got to go, but I've got some things to do. He said, why don't you wait and we'll go together? No, i got to go on. So he went on. Neighbor, other neighbor started off out the next day, wasn't very early. He soon overtook the first fella. And he said, man, said, I thought you was going to town. Well, he said, I am. And you've only made this distance. Well, he said, haven't you seen all those dogs?